Get Rich Education is brought to you by Ridge Lending Group, Apartment Investor Mastery, and Producers Wealth. You're listening to the show that has created more passive income for people than nearly any show in the world. This is the powerful Get Rich Education. Welcome to GRE, episode 194, from Glasgow, Scotland to Glasgow, Montana, and across 188 nations worldwide, this is Get Rich Education. I'm Keith Weinhold. What's the latest in the larger apartment building space, specifically 60 units and greater? That's our topic today. Now, you've heard me mention that larger apartments are a trickier place to navigate than they were, say, five years ago. But today's guest can help steer you through that like almost no one else can. Now, several weeks back, we discussed single-family home investing, and specifically in Central Florida. Then, three weeks ago, we went larger and spent a show focused on duplexes and fourplexes. This week, it's larger apartment buildings. And it's not that the opportunity is gone there, but you do have to look harder to find it. Now, I want you to consider a little something about leverage here first. Last week, I mentioned that if you get a $30 annual rent increase on your $1,000 rent, well, that's only a not so thrilling 3% rent increase. But when you're leveraged, you might have a $200 cash flow from that unit. Well, then that $30 increase therefore means a 15% increase to your cash flow. That matters. That's the money that you feel in your pocket every month. And look, you're actually benefiting from leverage again. Because look, instead, say that you had that unit in a paid off position. Well, if it's in a paid off position, you might have, say, a $600 cash flow on that unit because you have no mortgage payment. Well, you're still only going to get the same $30 rent increase on a $1,000 rent, even if it's paid off. So then your $600 cash flow, that only went up to $630. Well, that's just a 5% cash flow increase because the property is paid off. Remember, you had a 15% cash flow increase on the leveraged property. And in either case, it's just a $30 rent increase. So my point is, yes, leverage wins. Again, financially free, just be debt free, yet another way. And then additionally, you would own more leveraged properties and fewer paid off ones because you spread your money across multiple properties rather than focusing it all in one. Yes, financial leverage applies more places than only the capital appreciation component. Now, here's how that ties into what we're discussing today. What if you extrapolated that effect, that rent increase across an entire apartment building in all those units where you're leveraged? And that's what we're discussing today. Now, the difficulty with today's apartment space is that in a rising interest rate environment, people don't like the uncertainty of these shorter balloon periods tied to these commercial loans like I've discussed. And many people think that rates are going to be higher in five to seven years. And that's how short some of these balloon periods are. Well, what if someone knows how to navigate that and aimed for 10 to 12 years of fixed rate apartment financing, and he buys specifically in markets that are landlord and business friendly? Now, that is a more stable recipe. Let's meet today's guest. Today's guest keeps his thumb on the pulse of an apartment market like almost nobody else in America. He has received so many accolades, like the Top 50 Award for Real Estate Investment Opinion Makers and Market Leaders. In fact, in the industry, he is known as the Apartment King, and he has become renowned in showing his students how to retire in five years or less by investing in apartments. Welcome to Get Rich Education, Brad Sumrock. Hey, Keith. Thanks for having me on today. I'm excited to be here. I've got to tell you, congratulations. Your students closed on 37 apartment buildings just last year alone. What have they done this year? I was just going through that with my team. So we have 16 properties that have already closed so far in 2018. 
and we have 14 more that are in escrow or under contract to be closed. So by, I would say the end of June or early July, we'll have 30 properties closed and we did 37 all of last year. So it's a great year for, you know, all the, the people that were able to help get into the apartment syndication business. Now, Robert Kiyosaki's been here on the show with us a few times, and he tells us that he began with buying one small rental unit in Maui. I started with the fourplex building. You, in 2005, after you had worked 17 years at your corporate job with absolutely zero prior experience, you began with buying a 32-unit apartment building for yourself, and then you would go on to make more than a million dollars in profit just from your first two apartment deals. So tell us, how do you do that? The first thing is, you know, if you look at the name of the show, Get Rich Education, is it really starts with education. So I'm really big into yeah. education. I'm big into mentorship. You know, I have a lot of mentors myself. I mean, if people look at my Facebook page, they'll see me with Tony Robbins and Robert Kiyosaki and Tom Wheelwright and Kenny McElroy, and I'm learning from all these people. So, you know, the thing is, Keith, a lot of people stop learning when they get out of college. And I did that for 17 years. I had an engineering degree and then, well, I went back and learned more and got an MBA, but I wasn't really learning much after that about business and entrepreneurship. So it was really when I read the Robert Kiyosaki book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and learned about ESBI that I really decided that I need to invest in my education and learn how to become an investor and a business owner. That embodies the Jim Rohn quote, formal education will make you a living, self-education will make you a fortune. Well, I couldn't agree more. That book really changed my life. You know, when I read that book in like the early 2000s, and then I ended up going to a, a real estate investing seminar. And, you know, it's like, oh, my God, you're going to a seminar like, oh, you're going to get ripped off. They're going to try to sell you something. <laughs> I had all those skepticisms myself. And what I learned is, look, if you want to work with somebody that's been there and done that and that's successful and that's already a millionaire, you know, doing what it is that you want to learn how to do, that advice isn't going to come for free. Now, fast forward to 2018, there's been quite a price run up in the apartment space here in recent years. You provide apartment market forecasts. So just talk about the importance of what the market is doing today, because some people are concerned that the asset is highly priced. The first thing is there has been cap rate compression all over the United States across all asset classes, including apartments. And, you know, that's a fancy term, cap rate compression. Or what it really means is, in layman's terms, is that the same building we were buying for 50000 a door two years ago might be seventy or 80000 a door today. I hear a lot of people saying, oh, you know, the market has peaked. It's not a good time to buy. We can't find any deals that meet our projected return. So that's a question that I get a lot. And, you know, the truth is, is that, well, first of all, I just mentioned that my students have already have 30 deals either closed or in progress this year. So we're finding deals that work. You might have to just look at more deals. I'm personally buying a deal that's closing in two weeks. It's the first deal since 2005 or six that I have not syndicated. And the new tax laws right now, Keith, are very favorable for apartment investors. So there's a lot of things that, you know, for example, there's bonus depreciation. And I'll give a plug for Tom Wheelwright here. But in the past, you can only get bonus depreciation on new development and now you can get it on existing assets. So that's a game changer for a lot of investors. And so even though the cap rates have compressed, we could still find good deals that could get you that double digit average annualized return. And I'll also say that the returns that I'm seeing now on average are a little bit lower than they were two years ago, but I don't still feel like we're compromising. I mean, my view is where else could I safely and securely and predictably get a 13 to 15 percent IRR, even though it might have been 18 to 20 in the past, I'm still happy with that. And a lot of our investors are, too. So that's my answer to that question. Yeah. So cap rate compression or capitalization rate compression, maybe another way to say that is yield compression. So in the example Brad gave, say a per unit price of an apartment building has gone from 50K up to 70K. Well, that's a 40 percent increase. But when rents do not increase proportionally, 
disproportionately by as much as 40 percent over that period of time. That's why your yield compresses. And that's caused some people to say, well, is it too late? Have I missed out? And I think Brad, and I would generally agree with this, would be, well, then where else are you going to invest if you're not going to invest in real estate when you understand all the ways that it pays you? And yes, that tailwind from bonus depreciation, and Tom Wilwright was here a couple months ago to go over that with us, is another boon to new investors. When interest rates were going lower back in 2002 to 2006, when I was just getting started, you know what happened then? more tenants could afford to move out of the places I was running to them and go get a loan. So yes, back in 2002 to 2006, my tenants were leading. But look, now apartment prices have risen. The interest rate rise has also begun lagging behind the apartment price increase. Well, higher interest rates are likely going to go on to mean better tenant retention for you because it's harder for that tenant to buy. It gets increasingly harder for them to qualify for a loan. So a central question then is really, can you still buy an apartment building right and not have to wait too long for the retention and the rent increases to catch up proportionally? Absolutely. We talked about rent increases not keeping up with pricing, but rents have gone up. So in that example where pricing has gone up 40% in two years, well, and look, just to be clear, we're not buying in every market. So right. we buy in markets that are landlord and business friendly, that have job growth, population growth, and rent growth above the U.S. average, cap rates above the U.S. average. So we're we're very market specific and strategic on where we buy. And then we still might have to look at multiple deals before we find one that works. So I just want to throw that out there. It's not like everything we look at is just a slam dunk deal. That's not the case. But the point is, is that say in DFW or in Jacksonville or in Phoenix or in Atlanta, which are some of the deals that we're buying in, you know, rents have gone up 30 percent. Pricing has gone up 40, but rents have gone up 30. And there is still a, a housing shortage. If you look at all the industry data and you combine the number of new single family and new multifamily construction, it's still not keeping up with the demand for housing. And the other thing is, Keith, is I'm not buying or advocating that you buy the A-class product, which is where all the new development is happening, because that's where right now we're already seeing a softening of the market with lower occupancies and concessions. And if you look at a lot of across the, the major cities in the United States and the urban cores and you see all the cranes in the skyline, that's not where we're buying. We're buying sort of in the suburban perimeters and secondary markets where there's still workforce, a need for workforce housing, and the demand is far ahead of the supply. To your point, 12 years ago, generally housing in the United States was in an overbuilt condition. Today, we're in the opposite condition. We're underbuilt. So just the economics 101 of supply and demand are a tailwind for housing investors today. And look, Investors keep investing. Investors don't stop investing just because the climate changes. Professional investors keep investing and they change their strategy. And I think that's what you're telling us. So you touched on some of these maybe secondary or tertiary markets that you're looking at. So, you know, I want to ask you, being the apartment king, doing all this research, what's really an underlooked apartment niche? And this might be where you're steering your students to, whether that's a certain geography or a certain use type. Where's really that underlooked apartment building opportunity today? It's not like I have some magic formula, you know, and I get asked this and I hear other speakers get asked the same thing. So it's not like there's this secret market out there, Keith, that nobody knows about where it's like, oh, my God. But what I'm saying is, is if you could think of, you know, maybe that workforce housing area that you drove past a year or two ago and you thought, ah, you know, I'm not sure about this area. You might want to drive through it again and take another look because this is where we're finding the deals. OK, a lot of these areas have gentrified. They've improved. I mean, in Dallas, where I currently invest a lot and run our one of our businesses, there are areas where five years ago I wouldn't invest there. but now. Other owner operators have come in and, and a lot of these areas have transformed and we could still find good value out of opportunity. So, again, if you look in the suburban rings around the urban cores and identify the C and B class demographic, which are pockets of people that earn, say, 30 to 60,000 a year, I think you could still find some deals. And then obviously, you know, 
like in Texas, people were looking in the major markets like Houston, Dallas, Austin, San Antonio, and there are still deals to be found there. But we also have clients buying in places like Abilene, Lubbock, Wichita Falls, just to name a few. So that example is not unique to Texas. I think there's really some golden material in there, including if you looked at an area five years ago and there's something you didn't like about it, look again, that might have changed. Brad, just tell us about when you have a student, what do you do with them? Is it buy and hold? Is it value add? And what is the whole time look like for what you're doing with your students? What I do with my students is the same thing that I do for myself. So I've owned just over 3,800 doors. Currently, it's about 2,200 because I like to buy, hold, and then sell within a five-year period. So that's what I advise my students to do. And the reason is typically after five years, we go in, we look for value-add opportunities. So that value-add, there's usually a capital improvement component, and you get 70 to 80% of that capital improvement budget from your lender. Well, after five years, some of those capital improvements start to experience wear and tear. So for example, the flooring you put in, the appliances you put in. So I like to sell within five years is the answer that I have. Value add, we're talking about things like upgraded kitchens to carports. Yeah, so value add is, this is my recipe. We look for deals that are already economically stable. So we're looking for deals in that occupancy range and income range that already provide positive debt coverage, which means the income produced from the property is already going to cover the loan payment that you're going to secure. And that's how you're going to get your best financing, your non-recourse fixed rate financing from Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. So these are the type of loans that we want. And so those are the types of deals that we buy. But then, Keith, we also look for, is the property being mismanaged? Does it need capital improvements? For example, we'll buy a 200-unit building where maybe only 30 of the units have been upgraded, and then we could come in and upgrade the remaining 170. Or maybe they didn't upgrade the exterior of the property, and maybe the clubhouse and the amenity package is lagging compared to the competition. So we can go in and upgrade those amenities and exterior of the property, and then we could get the rents back up to the competition or even higher than the competition, you know, with potentially a better management play as well. Now, I know some of you are listening out there right now thinking 200 units. I'm scared. That's overwhelming. I can't afford it. I don't have the money for that. Well, I think the good news is that you don't have to be able to afford that 200 unit apartment building yourself. I'm going to ask Brad about that some more. You're listening to Get Rich Education. Our guest is the apartment king, Brad Sumrock. More when we come back. I'm your host, Keith Weinholz. For an income property investor like you that needs an income property loan, go to Ridge Lending Group. And over the years, you've heard owner Chaley Ridge generously give her time to you right here on the show as a guest. Ridge provides investment property loans in almost every U.S. state, and you're going to find out how they've helped more Americans realize their dreams of financial freedom through real estate than any other mortgage lender in the entire nation when you get started at RidgeLendingGroup.com. MC Lobsher is the host of the top-rated business and investing podcast, Cashflow Ninja, and also the president of Producers Wealth. Producers Wealth assists people in creating, protecting, and perpetually multiplying wealth in any economy through creating processes that help them increase their production, provide them with liquidity, passive income generators, and opportunities for enormous growth. Learn more about their time-tested and proven systems at yourownbankingsystem.com. This is our Rich Dad, Poor Dad author, Robert Kiyosaki. Listen to Get Rich Education with Keith Weinhold. And the reason I respect Keith, he's a very strong, smart, bright young man. Welcome back to Get Rich Education. We're talking with Brad Sumrock about apartment building investing today. You can check him out at bradsumrock.com. Brad, some people are scared off by apartment building deals because they're just big deals. For example, I know that you have sort of a minimum and you have a really important threshold of 60 units and that one typically wants 60 or more units in order to have some economies of scale and some on-site management. 
But even there, people think 60 units, that might cost 4 million bucks. So a 20 to 25% down payment with closing costs, that might be a million dollars. Now, how in the heck would I afford these big deals? Well, that's a great question. And that's what prevented me in the beginning from thinking about apartments before I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, because I actually thought I was going to start with a duplex and then a fourplex and then just trade my way up, you know, using my own money. Yeah. So the cool thing about syndicating deals, you know, syndication is a fancy term for pulling other people's money together along with your own. And then you form an LLC that's going to go and buy this apartment business. Okay. So let's take a $5 million deal as an example. The numbers aren't always going to be exact, but if you could get an 80% loan, then that's a $4 million loan, but you still need a million dollar down payment. Yeah. So a lot of people don't have a million dollars. Some people do. And if you do, and you want to invest that million dollars into that property, then you could be what I call an individual owner and you could buy that deal outright and secure the loan based on your own net worth and, and liquidity. But most people aren't in that situation. So to get the million dollars, let's say that you have $50,000 that you could put in as skin in the game into the deal. So that means that on average, you would need 19 other people with $50,000. And that $50,000 that you, the sponsor, put in yourself, that's really important to prove to those other 19 that you have skin in the game. It's true. I, I think it's a big statement that, you know, it's not legally required. But I mean, the reality is, is that especially if you're new, you have to ask, well, why would somebody put their money into your deal if you don't have the money or you're not putting your money into your own deal? So you get 20 people, including yourself, you pull your money together. In this case, you would need to talk to a securities attorney because the SEC is involved. And that's probably a whole nother topic for another show. Right. You know, is why, why is the SEC involved in apartment building? But you basically you're raising private equity. So you got to follow certain rules with that the SEC provides. And so you need a securities attorney. And it sounds complicated, but it's not really that complicated. I mean, I'm going to make it sound simple. But if you could learn, you know, how to flip a house or how to be an engineer or how to be an accountant, you could learn how to pick up the phone and hire a securities attorney and how to properly syndicate an apartment building. So really, you just need to find people that they are educated, that are either accredited or sophisticated and have money to invest. And the cool thing about being the syndicator, Keith, is that you could own a higher percentage of the company than you're contributing your capital. So let's say you put in 50000 and you raise a million from other people. Well, you're putting up 5% of the money, but wouldn't it be cool if you could put up 5% of the money and say own 15% of the company that's going to buy that apartment building. And that's called carried interest. And that's one of the things that syndicators do is they put up a percentage of the money, but they have additional ownership interest in that LLC. And so the way to really fast track your own financial situation and get out of that rat race is to syndicate deals. Now, if you don't want to syndicate the deal and you simply want to be a passive investor, which is another phenomenal way to go, then you meet a syndicator and you put your money into their deals and you sit back and do virtually nothing. And again, all the deals that at least my students are doing are providing double digit average annual returns. And I can't say every one of them has, there's no guarantee that that's what the deals are projected to earn and the vast majority are doing so. Now, Brad has a live event that he operates regularly, and he can tell you how to get in on both sides of this for you to learn how to be a syndicator yourself, an aggregator where you pull together other people's money, or you can be one of those people that contributes money to another syndicator. So you really understand both sides, and Brad can really help you a number of different ways, not just with the education, but with the connections at his live event that we'll tell you about shortly. But Brad, these days, you know, some people have thoughts about financing. That's a greater concern for people with mortgage interest rates rising. You mentioned non-recourse and fixed rate loans earlier. Just tell us a bit more about the financing availability in terms for apartments today. Well, that's the other thing. So if you buy right, you know, listen to what we talked about on the show and we're buying stabilized properties where there's a, a debt coverage ratio of positive number, which means the income generated from the property exceeds the debt payment, 
actually it's easier to get a better loan on a larger deal than a smaller deal. So, you know, if you buy a property yeah. under a million dollars, you're probably going to get full recourse, which is personal liability. And you might get a 65 to 70 percent LTV. But, you know, you buy a five or 10 or 15 million dollar building and you can get up to 80 percent of the price, up to 80 percent of the rehab. And most likely the deal is going to be non recourse. OK, the loan is going to be non recourse. Now, the other thing, just like you have to syndicate your equity raise to come up with a down payment, you may have to have a few other people guarantee the loan with you because the lender is still going to look for net worth and liquidity requirements even to secure that non-recourse loan. But again, if you're in a network of people, not to promote myself, but if you're in a network of people like the one I've created, it's pretty easy to find not only passive investors, but people that will help you secure that loan to meet the lender requirements. And so that's pretty much how things get done in this world of 60 unit and up apartment buildings. We're talking about income streams. That's what supports all of this. That's what makes it viable. So income streams come from tenants. So just talk about the typical tenant in you and your students' buildings. We look for C-class and B-class assets. And the definition of that, in my own words, are these are buildings that are typically built in the 1960s, 1970s, 1980s, and maybe the early 90s. And the average income of the tenants living in these properties is generally going from 30000 per year to, say, the mid-60,000 per year. So if you buy a 1980s asset with a, an average income of 60000 a year, you're more into the B-class type of asset. So a B-class is going to be a little bit newer building, a little bit higher income level, a little bit lower cap rate. But on average, it's a little bit more of a desirable asset because of the age of the building and the clientele. So a C-class is going to be more of like a 60s or 70s building with an average income of about thirty to 40000 a year. And this is the bread and butter of what I buy and what I've been buying for 16 years and what my students are buying. If there's a secret out there, it's we're not developing buildings. We're not buying complete pieces of crap that are boarded up. We're buying stabilized workforce housing in markets that meet the criteria that I went through. And, you know, we should be able to, like the deal I'm buying right now, I'm closing next week. I'm going to get 11% cash on cash. And this is like with all of the pricing compression and cap rate compression, and my IRR is going to be 20%. So there's still good deals out there. Yeah, that's terrific. Now we talk about the tenants providing that income that income being a big part of the capitalization rate. Capitalization rate is net operating income divided by purchase price. And that's what these apartment buildings are valued on. So you have a lot of people looking at these, analyzing pro formas, making projections to decide what kind of offer they want to put in on an apartment building. And, you know, that kind of brings up the point, Brad, like today there are probably going to be multiple offers on an apartment building. So what are some of those things that you can do to give your students the edge in this multiple offer environment that we're in? There are so many people that are looking for, you know, oh, I only buy off-market deals and da-da-da-da-da. I mean, you didn't even ask me that question. But, you know, most of the deals that we're buying are coming through brokers because, look, if you think about ESBI, you want to be a business owner, and we are buying – properties from business owners. And so business owners are going to employ brokers to sell these properties. That's not to say that the broker may offer you an off-market deal. In 16 years, I think maybe one time I dealt directly with a seller. So the first thing is you want to get to know, once you pick your target markets, you want to get to know the brokers in that market that specialize in apartment buildings. And then it really just comes down to also it's not just what you know, but who you know. So do you know the brokers? Do they trust you? Do you have credibility with them? Are they going to vouch for you? Because what people are looking for is certainty that you can close. So it's not always the highest price or the best terms. Right. It's, is this deal going to close? That's what the seller wants to know. Is the deal going to close? And so a lot of times they're going to look at the team that you have. Like, you know, a lot of my students are new, Keith. They don't have a lot of experience, but they're able to go out and take down a 60, 80, 100, sometimes 100 plus unit deal on their first transaction because 
they've aligned themselves in that market with the people that are known to be the key players. They have experienced lender on their team, experienced management company on their team. They have attorneys that have good reputations that are not known to be deal killers on their team. You know, my students have me on on their team and, you know, we're buying all over the country. So they're able to leverage that resume where they don't yet have their own. Gosh, that is such a great point. The strength of your offer to purchase an apartment building is not just based on the amount of dollars that you offer for the property. With Brad on your side, you might be able to offer less than somebody else, but your deal might still look better. Look, we're always competitive. Like, I'm not saying we're going to get the deal for millions of dollars less. That's not what I'm saying. But we're not always the highest yeah. price or the most aggressive terms because they know that we're going to close the deal. Tell us something that your student typically learns that they did not know before and they've been elevated to greater knowledge since working with you. What are some of those things? The first thing is my students have access to me and I've been doing it 16 years and have 3,800 doors. So I could help them shortcut the process. I mean, they could figure it out on their own, surely. But I think I could just help them go faster with less mistakes by leveraging my personal experience, but it doesn't stop with me. In the beginning, when we started our company in 2013, it was all about Brad's mentoring. But now we have a whole network of experienced lenders, attorneys, management companies, the reputation of our program where the brokers in multiple markets know about the Sumrock program and how we perform and how we close deals. And we have an entire ecosystem of people that not every one of my students wants to be a syndicator. A lot of them simply want to be passive investors. So, you know, if you think about not only the mentoring and the coaching, but also the relationships and building your team and also having the potential to raise money from other investors, I think we just make it easier for people all around. If you try to navigate taking down a big apartment building yourself, it could take you years and you can really collapse time frames with Brad. And I think I found that your success as a teacher has a lot to do with the fact that you're not just a person that like used to do this. You are as active in the apartment building space as a person possibly could be. And I got to tell you, as far as your events go, I've been investing in real estate for 16 years, and I have never seen anything like what you are doing with your training events. You sell out these events in a big room where there's a lot of positivity in the room, and you have this formidable cavalcade of motor coaches that goes around. So there is the field trip component of the event where you're getting out and looking at some buildings. Yeah, I mean, our last several events, we actually – had to turn people away that wanted to purchase tickets because the venue only hold 430 people. So now for July, we've actually moved to a larger venue. We could hold double the amount of people. I mean, I'm not sure if we're going to get 800 in, in July, but we have room to grow and we could train more people. And so that's where we're at, Keith. I mean, we had to decide, well, do we want to keep it at 400 and double the triple the price or do we want to get a bigger venue so we could accommodate more people? And we went with the second option. Tell us about your event dates and what someone can learn there. So we typically do our weekend events three times a year. We do them in July, November, and March. So our next one coming up is July 21st and 22nd, 2018, and that's in Dallas, Texas. And all of our weekend trainings are in Dallas. And what we do is... I talk about three ways to buy and invest in multifamily, and they're the three ways that I've personally done it. So if I haven't done it, I don't teach it. I don't teach theory. I teach my own experience. So I teach the whole event. This is not a multi-speaker event. Right. So it's Brad for 16 hours, and I walk him through you know, how to be a passive investor and make intelligent investment decisions, how to be a syndicator and raise money and find deals and evaluate deals and underwrite deals and do due diligence and rehab and how to connect and work with brokers. So I walk people through the entire process of everything from getting ready to do a deal and preparing your financial statement and targeting different markets to, you know, the nuts and bolts of finding and evaluating deals. 
That is July 21st and 22nd in Dallas, Texas. What is the best way for them to get started on that? Well, the simplest and best way is just for them to go to my website, which is bradsumrock.com, and there's no C in my last name. So it's B-R-A-D-S-U-M-R-O-K.com, and then there's a events tab, and you just click on the events tab, and then you can see that upcoming training event. If that piqued your interest at all, I really recommend you moving at the speed of instruction at bradsumrock.com. Brad Sumrock, it's been great having you on the show. Awesome. It's been my pleasure, and I had a great time. Well, yeah, great material from Brad. He knows how to navigate today's apartment space where we have both higher apartment prices and higher interest rates today. Now, the recent rollback of the Dodd-Frank Act, that could make your borrowing of money from local lenders for you flow more easily for apartment buildings. And local lenders shouldn't be overlooked. They're potentially going to play a bigger lending role with this Dodd-Frank policy change. And if you're a borrower at a local bank, it's less likely that you're going to have to fit into some big institutional one-size-fits-all checklist. That's because oftentimes a local bank, they might hold your loan right there in their own portfolio, meaning that it doesn't need to meet all these strict requirements if they were instead going to have to securitize your loan and then go out and sell it to someone else on the open market. Now, as far as asset type, Brad is talking about workforce housing, and that's really a demographic that we're pretty used to serving here at Get Rich Education. I think of workforce housing as tenants that are working a day job. If you visited your property at 11 a.m., you really don't want to see a car in the driveway. You don't want that car to be in its parking space. You want that person to be off working. So at Brad's upcoming July 21st and 22nd event, besides just getting the valuable course room instruction, on top of that, you're going to go out into the field on the motor coach with everyone else and look at some properties. And then on top of that, you're going to meet a team who can help you. And above all that, you're just going to meet a whole lot of like-minded people. And like I said, I've never seen anything like not just the following that Brad has, but the track record of proven results that Brad Sumrock and his students have. You could be a Sumrocker in a few weeks in Dallas yourself. You know, the other thing to love about Brad, besides just his knowledge and his track record and his network and his great energy, is that he is outcome-based. It's more than buying apartment buildings. It's the fact that he helps you exit the rat race in five years or less. That is a result. Big thanks to Brad Sumrock dropping the knowledge today. Get started at bradsumrock.com. I'm Keith Weinhold, and of course, I'll be back next week to help you build your wealth. Don't quit your daydream. Nothing on this show should be considered specific, personal, or professional advice. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, financial, or business professional for individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own. Information is not guaranteed. All investment strategies have the potential for profit or loss. The host is operating on behalf of Get Rich Education, LLC, exclusively. If you want to retire in five years or less through real estate investing, then pay close attention as I'm about to share my proven recipe with you. This is Brad Sumrock, and I've taught thousands of people just like you how to replace their incomes, quit their jobs, or simply have more income and freedom than they ever thought possible. And we do this by investing in apartment buildings. After starting with no experience, I managed to pocket over a million dollars in cash and retire from my 17-year corporate job after only three years of apartment investing. And I have hundreds of successful students that have had similar results. If you want to get out of the rat race or simply have more income and freedom in your life, then investing in apartment buildings might be the answer for you. Visit our website at bradsumrock.com to get more information about our upcoming training events. That's B-R-A-D-S-U-M-R-O-K dot com. The preceding program was brought to you by your home for wealth building, GetRichEducation.com.